Yes guys, welcome back to another video here on the Andy Hashtag One channel. It's Tuesday, which means it's another episode of Tuesday Talks where I sit down and chat to somebody from the world of football about their experiences, about how they've come to where they are today. The guest on today's episode is a goalkeeping coach. It's not a player, it's a coach. So we've got Craig McCreeth talking to today. He's first team goalkeeping coach down at Reading Women. Uh, he's coaching currently Grace Maloney, who's an in Irish international, and also Rachel Laws, who's been in England squads previously. Uh, he's previously been at Barnet as a first team goalkeeping coach there, where he was the youngest coach in the English Football League. He's also coached uh, London Bees, which is the women's team associated with Barnet, as well as in academies at Watford and also Barnet as well. So he's got a wealth of experience. He's a highly qualified goalkeeping coach. So we really interested to see what Craig uh, has got to say about his experiences, any advice he might need to, he might pass on to younger goalkeepers and younger coaches. So let's get into the video. Craig. Hey. You made it. Yeah, just about, just about. You pulled across, you pulled uh, to the side of the road, all right. Yeah, 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 mental, mental one. Yeah, it's right. For everyone who is watching there, Craig gave me a panicked phone call about 20 minutes ago, going, I'm not going to be able to get home. Can we do this by the side of the road? <laughs> yeah, got to improvise, didn't you? Sometimes. Well, you're in. You made it. It's good. You four G is good. Uh, Grace is in, by the way. Just to let you know. Ah, uh, oh, yeah. So be careful of whatever you're going to say about her uh, throughout this conversation. Ah, uh, Nath. Yes, Nath. Uh, we had Nath on a couple of weeks ago. Actually, fascinating story for Nathan. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just in there. So if anyone else hasn't watched that, get onto my YouTube page uh, and it's on that. It's a great chat. Uh, so thanks for joining. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Uh, give a I'll give a little bit of a background to you as far as I know, as far as your Wikipedia page tells me. <laughs> yeah. You have yeah. a Wikipedia page. Um, but in general, in terms of your coaching journey, then you've coached at academies in Barnet and Watford. Yeah. You've been first team goalkeeping coach or head of goalkeeping at London Bees, which is the women's team associated with Barnet. You were then the, the youngest coach in the English Football League uh, when you were the first team goalkeeping coach at Barnet. Yeah. And now you're the uh, goalkeeping coach at Reading Women's Team, where you're coaching uh, Grace, as we just mentioned, who's an Irish international. Yeah. And you're also coaching uh, Rachel Laws, who's been a couple of uh, England squads herself as well. So you're coaching two top quality goalkeepers there. And we've got... And he's just jumped on as well, Robber. So I missed that. You, you broke what up a, a little bit there. Kit man. Best kit man in the league, Robber. He's just jumped on here as well. He's he's having a little watch. Okay. So. Right. So that's that's in terms of you and your background and your coaching uh, yeah. that you've been to. So we're going to spend the next half hour, 40 minutes away. Uh, also, just chatting through how you've got to where you are today. Mm -hmm. That's basically about it. So um, I'm actually going to start off with you obviously missed me Farrah Williams wow another England international yeah. As, yeah we should get some of these people in in order to chat about their journey as well so when you get back to the training ground one you can have a little little word with them as well I'll have a chat I, I'll use you to get other people in <laughs> so yeah we, we're going to chat for about half an hour or so just to get up to up to speed about where you are, how you got to, the various different experiences that you've had and any advice that you might want to pass on. Because we've got a lot of young coaches uh, who, who are in and who follow me. We've got a lot of young goalkeepers as well. So we're always looking for that little nugget of advice. So yeah. take, this, take this back to the very beginning of all sorts. Did you play? Uh, you could call it that, yeah. I, uh, I did try. I was at a um, few academies. I was at QPR as a under-14 um, was lucky enough to have Raheem Sterling in um, in our age group before he we went to Liverpool. Um, was at Watford very briefly, um, and I spent about a week with Spurs um, as an under sixteen as well. Um, and then just sort of bounced around a few sort of um, you know, step three to step six clubs um, in the area, sort of semi pro, the, the verges of that. Um, and then sort of jumped into coaching from about the age of 18. Um, so small, very small playing background, nothing really to shout about. But So then why coaching? Just wanted to stay involved in football, really. Um, you know, it's a massive hobby, always has been. Um, and a, a big passion of mine, goalkeeping particularly. And to now do that for a living is pretty much living the dream. 
So you were 18 when you started off on your coaching journey. Yeah. What were those first initial steps into coaching? What did they look like? Um, do you know what? It, it just came out of the blue pretty much. Um, I, it probably goes back more when I was at, um, at college. One of the tutors at college coached Barnet Ladies. Um, and she said, oh, do you fancy coming down and, and jumping in a couple of sessions because you haven't got a goalkeeper? So I thought, yeah, why not? A bit of extra work, a bit of extra training. Um, and she then was like, oh, can you come and do a match day warm up? And it sort of spiralled from there. I'd lead a few sessions when the keeper was in and, and everything else. Um, when they eventually turned into London Bees, the requirements changed. They had to have certain qualifications as a goalkeeping coach, which I didn't have. Um, so they got Steve Fraser in. Um, and when he left, he said to me, oh, look, I'm leaving Barnet Academy. I'm still going to do the women's team. Do you want to do um, the academy? So I jumped in. I was working in the academy. I was doing under, uh, under nines through to under 16s initially. Um, and then Steve left London D's in the December. Um, and I took over that as well. So at that stage, what sort of qualifications had you been through? I only had my level one, which working in an academy was a big no. <laughs> Um, obviously, you've got to have your B licence. Um, but at that time, I wasn't 100% sure coaching was what I wanted to do. So I gave it a little bit of time and, and eventually realised, probably after about a year, that coaching was definitely the direction I wanted to go in. Um, so I was able to, to sort of use the money that I generated, got onto my level two, did my level two goalkeeping. Um, then fairly soon after, did the B licence and goalkeeping B licences. Um, and now I've just started the UA for A licence goalkeeping as well. That's one thing that I didn't say actually in the little intros that you know, you've been accepted onto your A licence course, haven't you? So in terms of the, the coaching pyramid, A licence, pro licence at the top. So you've become one of the top qualified goalkeeping coaches in the country, essentially with an A licence when you've been through that. So that's a massive achievement. Yeah. So looking at that, so you're currently at, at Barnet Academy, you're coaching under nines to under 16s. <clears throat> What's yeah. the sort of differences in the coaching of that? Because that's quite a spectrum. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? At the time, looking back on it now, I, I came across cleaning through my room the other day and I came across some old session plans that I'd written up on paper and I looked at it and thought, my God, is that what I used to, to think coaching was? Um, and do you know what? If I'm honest, looking back, I probably coach the same things. But it's the detail you work in. Um obviously looking at your younger age groups, you're, you're focusing a lot more on really building the foundations, um, basic techniques, movement patterns. And as you move through, you start linking that into a bit more tactical understanding, decision-making um, as well. So you've kind of touched on there a little bit of a coaching philosophy-ish. Have you changed your mindset then or what your outputs would be around that the longer that you've coached and been in the game? Yeah, for sure. I think now, and obviously uh, your philosophy has to fit your environment as well. Um, so I probably coach in a very different way when I was working with the first team at Barnet as I would do coaching now um, at Reading. Um, just because of the, the coaching styles differ between club um, and the players, the individual needs differ as well. Um, probably at the time at Barnet, it, I was a lot more, um, I had to dictate and that was my my way of coaching whereas now I, I tend to challenge the keepers through questions and problem solving um, as opposed to giving them the answer straight away I just you, you try and give them a scenario to solve and fix the problem um, themselves with a little bit of help and you sort of drip feed um, any information in um, as and when they need that what's dictated the change between the two styles then um, environment definitely so working in different clubs um that's been a big factor um and my understanding of coaching and, and how individuals and how players develop um that's been quite a big driving factor in adjusting how i coach as well um, and obviously working with different individuals um we had obviously grace and lawsy at reading um over the last couple of years and I, i'd coach them in slightly different ways so even within the same team we, you get to work at such an individual level with as a goalkeeper that you really can tailor how you coach to different uh, to your individuals. So within, it's a good good point you just made there. But in terms of the goalkeeping coach versus an outfield coach, you're working mm -hmm. very much on a much smaller basis. 
So how does that change or how does that differ in comparison if you're in a, a larger group with a large amount of numbers? What are the sort of differences you might see between the two? When you're working in big numbers, you tend to deliver much more general uh, information. And we're quite lucky with the set. We've got a red and we've got, um, we've got four outfield coaches within the first team. So in a normal session, you're probably looking at a, a sort of one to four, one to five ratio. Um, and within those coaches, there's coaches who will be sort of more position specific, um, be that sort of an attacking focus or a defensive focus. Um, so they, there we're getting the real individual stuff with the outfielders um, in in that. Um, but goalkeeping sessions, when I work with the, the youngsters, I, I try and keep groups as a maximum of sort of five. I think if you start going um, above that, there's so much to goalkeeping or asking goalkeepers to do so much. You lose a lot of your, your detail um, and you miss a lot of the small details when, you, when you're looking at such big groups. But then your trade-off is that when you've got your bigger groups, you're, you're able to work more realistic practices um, and pick, build more different game scenarios. Um, so there is a bit of a balance between working in your big numbers and in your small numbers. How do you, in your current role, I mean, we've kind of gone through, this is your journey and then jump yeah. Age, which we'll go back to but in your current role how yeah. do you how do you work that how what's your preferential way of working in terms of that small numbers to big numbers how does that work itself out at the club do you know what that for me actually varies depending on where we are in the week um so i quite like a, a tuesday to be more of a reflective day more of a day looking back at what's happened on the sunday is there any scenarios? Is there anything that caused us problems? Can we look at them again? Obviously, we'd have done the analysis in the morning and we try and recreate those pictures out on the pitch um, on the Tuesday. Tuesday's also a bit of more of a tempo day for the goalkeepers. Um, they have to get through a little bit more work um, from a physical aspect. Wednesday, I quite like a sort of few, few more keepers in. Um, so we'll try and bring some of the younger goalkeepers in, um, some of our academy keepers in where possible. Um, Try and build, start building in some game scenarios um, ahead of the weekend. Um, and we normally do some big picture stuff. Um, so having lots of keepers just allows me to rotate the keepers through and I can drip feed some more tactical information in while we're working in the big pictures as a whole team. Um, and then Thursday, again, Thursday is more of an out, a tempo day for the outfield players. So again, as the keepers, you're in and you're doing you're doing your, your, your bit of tempo working with them. Um, but again, like, like sort of smaller numbers on a Thursday. Um, and then I go for some more bigger numbers on a Saturday. Again, trying to recreate and, and build pictures ahead of the game on a, on a Sunday. Um, and you allow for greater work to rest ratios with your bigger numbers on the Saturday. Um, obviously not wanting to go into a game um, feeling any sort of fatigue or anything like that. So how does then that, from a goalkeeping element, fit into the wider structure of the four other or well, three of the coaches that you've got and also the kind of the week setup that you've got down at Reading. Yeah, so we Tuesday we're led a lot by uh sports science and medical and, and numbers. Um Tuesday for the outfield players uh, so outfield players and goalkeepers work at very different um intensities during the week. Outfield players tend to go there's your Saturday there's your Sunday is all the way up here as a peak. You then drop, you peak again on a Wednesday, you, you drop down and then you peak again on your Sunday. Whereas the goalkeepers, we tend to be a lot more, you tend to be sort of down here on a, on a Sunday because you get 15, 20 touches of the ball and you're not really doing a lot. To peaking on a Tuesday, dropping down a little bit on a Wednesday, peak on a Thursday and then you sort of taper off again um, on, the, on the Sunday. Um, so from that's that's it from a physical perspective. From an outfield, from a general session perspective, we tend to do a lot of tactical detail throughout the week, um, be that the goalkeepers and through um, and the goal and the um, outfield players. We tend to work in a lot of tactical detail because we're working with the elite. So your technical details are there. It's then you, you do refine stuff. We do sort of individual work um, post session where we refine individual technique. But a lot of the work is, a, is on a tactical basis throughout, um, with Thursday tending to be a bit more of a sort of light-hearted, upbeat, high-tempo day. Lots of sort of games, finishing practices, 1v1s, 2v2s, a bit of head tennis in there and stuff like that as well. 
So, I mean, that's very much about what your role is currently. I'm just going to take this conversation back a little bit. So you're now, we'll get back to this about what you're doing currently, what your role entails and the rest of it. That's really fascinating. I do like that in terms of how understanding how you tailor your week, essentially, and then how you fit in with the wider group and the interjection between the two. But mm -hmm. talking about you specifically, yeah. now going back, we were talking about you were uh, just taking over London Bees at that yeah. Time so now you're working both in Barnet Academy and London Bees. Yeah, Academy uh, boys, mm -hmm. open age old old. I was going to say old women, but old, open age <laughs> uh, women from there. So yes. you've got contrasting groups yeah. between the two. How did you kind of how how was that for you as a coach? First of all, um, it was great. Um, I really enjoyed that that period of my coaching career. It was it was my early early days um i was getting to know things i was trying things out i had a lot of freedom um i could almost use uh, academy sessions to, to test and try the waters with different session practices different setups um so then you know, make sure it was right for when i went and did it with the the women's team um because obviously you're competing you're, you're trying to win games academy football is all about developing your players developing your individuals um so having that balance and that sort of that, that trade-off with the two was, was really good. And then at that particular point in time, that's big when the step up to the Burn the Barnet first team came about as well. Yeah, that came a couple of years. It was near the end of my time there. Um, and Marlon, Marlon Beresford left quite short notice. Um, and the game was on a Sunday. I remember it was Newport County away. We lost 1-0. And, um, I was I was coaching a, a soccer school on a Saturday um, at the Hive at Barnet. Um, so I didn't have a job at the time. I'd just been made redundant. So I thought I'm going to invest loads of time into coaching and really try things out. And I was doing a lot of stuff actually um, for free um, just to gain some experience. And Rossi, who was assistant manager at the time, called me and said, look, the goalkeeping coach has left. We've got a game tomorrow. Can you come and do it? I was like, what, for the 23s? Who? He was like, no, 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 for the first team. So I was thinking, God, okay. And I remember I didn't sleep the whole night. I was I was just so scared. Um, not scared. A little bit scared, a little bit nervous, excited. Um, and, you know, it was it was great. It was it was just over 10,000 people at the game. And, and it, it's, a, it's a day that is always going to stick in my mind. Um you know, my first game as a senior first team coach in men's football um, is is always obviously going to be a memorable one for anyone. Um, so, and, uh, how old were you at this point? Twenty one. And uh, who was the goalkeeper at the time? Who was who were the two Jamie, keepers? Jamie Stevens, good good friend of mine now. Um, stayed in touch with him. Um, very good friend of mine. Um, we had Josh Vickers as well, who was at Lincoln last season. Um, he was on loan from us. For, uh, online to Barnet from Swansea. So you had two established first team footballers, yeah, first team goalkeepers who yeah. were potentially a little bit older than you, yeah, the, kind of mid twenties at the time. Yeah, yeah. We also had Benji Bouchel at the time as well. Um, he was online. I can't recall what club he was from, um, but we had Benji Bouchel. He was, he actually played in the Newport in the Notts County game, um, but that was the only game he was there for. Um, the only thing I worked with him so. But he was he was great. So you're a 21 year old who's stepping into this environment. Yeah. How did you prepare yourself for that then? Um, I mean, I'm not just talking about the specific game here, the one game, but more for the on the, the, the kind of lasting relationship. Like you're saying, you're now friends with Jamie Stevens. Yeah, so I, it's got to have gone pretty well. Look, it. I, I, do you know what? I went with it game by game. Um, so I, and day by day, I literally we, we went up and I did the game, and I thought, oh, this is going to be it. I love someone. Someone new will come in on the Monday and it'll all be fine because that's how first team football works. It's it's a fast revolving door. Um, and then I was on the bus back and Kevin Egypt went, oh, what time are you in tomorrow? I was like, uh, what time do you want me in? <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and, and that was it. And then I, I, I finished the season with him. And, and yeah, there were some very good memories. There was a horrific initiation that I had to do up at... Um, Hartlepool away, we won 2-0 the next day. So obviously my beautiful Justin Bieber rendition uh, gave the players a good good little G up the night before. So it must have made, the, made all the difference. Ah, uh, well, I mean, that's what I'm going to put it down to anyway. 
So then just in terms of you as, as now you're coaching players who are, uh, no offence to you, better goalkeepers than you. Yes. You're also you're now coaching people who are older than you. Yeah. Now, personally, I've always found that a little bit more difficult whenever you're put into that situation that you're coaching people who've been in the game longer than you, who are better than you yes. as well. Yet you're now supposed to be not necessarily the oracle of, but you're supposed to have some knowledge that you're imparting or helping them find in some particular way. So what, how did that go and how did you kind of face those challenges? Do you know what? So everywhere I've coached, if I've coached at senior level, I've always coached goalkeepers who are older than me. Um, Sophie Harris, when I was at London Bees, she was older than me by a couple of years. Um, Jamie and Josh were both older than me. Um, when I was at Watford, Nathan and Sam were the same age as me. Um, and at Reading, we've got G and Lawsey, who were both older than me. And Mary, when she was here, was all older than me. So any senior keeper I've worked with has always been older. But they're all professionals. And they trust that I've been employed by the club as the coach because I've got a level of understanding that's going to develop them as an individual. So instantly they give the respect straight away. Um, so it's not me trying to win them over. It's more them going, well, look, you're here as the coach, so I respect you and, and I respect what you say. And if I think I need to challenge something, I will challenge you in the right way. So, I mean, just the one question that has, has come in um, about what advice you'd give young coaches um, who are just starting out on their journey right now. So if you're going back and going back to a young Craig yeah. McCreeth, just starting off on your coaching journey, what sort of things would you be telling the young Craig McCreeth? Run. <laughs> Stop coaching. Don't do it. No, do you know what? People, go and watch people. Um, I mean, I've, I've never had the opportunity really to, to do that. And I think it's something that I'd love to go and do. I'd love to go in and watch not necessarily the top coaches, but just someone else work and just see what they do, how they do things and gain ideas, share ideas, because I've kind of just made it all up as I've gone along um, and done what I think would be right. Because I've never been a pro. I've never been in that environment before. Um, I've actually rarely ever had a goalkeeping coach when I've played. So... I'm not basing what I do off of anybody. I'm kind of just doing what I feel is right and, and what gets the best out of the goalkeepers I'm working with at the time. But given my time again, when I was younger and I didn't have any sort of financial commitments and stuff like that, I, I would have, I'd love to just go back in time and go, right, I'm going to go in and watch this person this week and I'm going to watch them for a couple. I'm going to watch them for a bit and really do that. But yeah, try and, and read as well, read books be a student of the game all the time you know I'm I'm very much a believer of that that you, you never know it all um, even now I'm, I'm obviously going through the BA license at the minute um, but I still read articles listen to podcasts books videos um, some of the stuff that um, Tim Dittman has been throwing out and, and the FA have been throwing out has been fantastic resources to to have a listen and look at um, and never stop your learning never think you know it all because you don't is, is there anyone who's been a kind of a coaching mentor to you throughout your journey so far? Um, to, to be fair, he called me earlier, actually, Stuart. Um, Stuart Sir at Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Women. Um, he wasn't necessarily a mentor as such, but he's someone that I've known. He's always there if I, need, if I had a sort of problem or challenge, particularly out in the, the sort of early days. Um, he'd, he'd be there to, I could turn to him and I knew I could ask a question if, if needs be. Um, Tony Roberts has been uh, the Welsh national team goalkeeping coach. Um, I sort of got to know him through doing the B licence goalkeeping with the Welsh FA. Um, and you know, there was sort of, we kind of stayed in touch and, and I've thrown some sort of challenges and questions his way. Um, and Tim Dittmer as well. Um, we, we speak very, very rarely nowadays, but um, also when I was at Watford, we, we would speak quite regularly uh, about goalkeepers and about coaching um, and I actually went up and shadowed him for a couple of days um, on a goalkeeping camp which was really nice yeah I'm a big fan of Tim Dittmer and the stuff that he puts out there he kind of he just asks the right questions it seems to be to make you question what you're doing and whether or not it's the right approach I like that and when you're talking about actually learning I think that's one of the good things about lockdown and what not to happen is the amount of initially it seems to have calmed down a little bit but there was a lot of sharing that was going on within the goalkeeping coaching community 
Yeah. It was a little bit of an overload at one point. I've still got a list of things to listen to and read and whatnot that I'll get to, but that, that's been very useful. Yeah. Just in terms of um, lockdown and whatnot, how's that impacted your role currently? I've been on furlough, so I've got a lovely tan. You've got a lovely tan. And you've got a good haircut there as well, actually. I don't know how you've managed to do that. Yeah, I've got a very skilled friend of a family, so masks and all sorts had to get it done. So being on furlough, that means that you're not actually allowed to do any work whatsoever. So you can't, well, you can speak to your, your team, but you can't, you know, making sure they're okay from a wellness health perspective, but you can't actually give them any work to do. Yeah, no, we've been touching base from a, a social perspective. Um, me and Grace have actually trained a few times um, because I play still, try to. Um, she, we've been doing a few seconds. We trained this morning. Um, so... Yeah, you, you, you know, staying in touch with players, trying to just sort of drop different players' messages every now and again, see how they're getting on. Um, more reacting to stuff they put on social media and it sort of sparks conversation. Um, but, yeah, other than that, there's really a lot else that I'm able to. The other thing, your, your season's been um, concluded now, hasn't it? It has, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, ha you happy with that outcome? Um, I think it's the most logical outcome. Um, I think the what was needed to get people back e from a financial perspective, it's not possible. Um, we don't have endless pots of money that we can dip into. That would have resulted in potentially cutting corners, which then puts people's health at risk. And there's nothing. Football's not big enough to risk people's health. Nothing is. So, yeah, I think the, the decision that's been made is, is the correct decision. And uh, I think that meant that you finished sixth. Didn't it? Fifth. fifth was it? Sorry, yeah, fifth. Happy, happy with finishing fifth. Fifth's good. Fifth's a really, really strong position for us to finish. Um, we were, we're quite happy with that. So going back again, I love, I love jumping about all over the place. But you and your journey. So now you're in Barnet first team. Yeah. In, and then your next move from there was to Reading Women. What? No, to Watford first what? within the academy. Yeah. Uh, within the academy setup there before then you you took your current role yeah uh, you've got so give us a full outline of what your actual role includes i know you're talking about the coaching side of things in the week and how you prep for that but that's only yeah. part of your role isn't it yeah so i look at um so analysis i do all the goalkeeping analysis so that's looking at opposition shots opposition chances created uh cross types in swing out swing um, player habits from the opposition and I condense all of that information and deliver it through basic analysis sessions or on pitch um, and my the week and the sessions is really tailored around what that looks like what do the opposition look like um, so we're trying to build as many pictures on the training pitch as we can um, then I help with the keepers in the gym um, just make sure they get through the programs, make sure they do all the right work, working at the right intensity and, and almost, you know, pop another 2.5 on each side. Oh, go and test yourself, go and get another rep out and you just try and try and maximise what they're getting out of that. Um, I try and I, I dip in and out with some defensive work as well, um, try and link in what the goalkeeper's doing, what the goalkeeper's saying, positions the goalkeeper takes up in with the back four so that there's a real understanding between the whole team and the whole defensive unit. Um, I've probably missed a few bits off, but, you know. Look. So when you were talking about your, your week in Europe, so Sunday's game day for you, so Monday's quiet day yeah. for the players anyway. So what, what does a Tuesday look like for you then? What time uh, do you get in? What do you do? What tasks? I'm, well, I'm in... Day in the life of a coach. I'm one of the first, so probably have to start the whole week. So Monday, I tend to be my analysis day. Um, so that's review from the game at the weekend and then into building and looking into the new week. Um, I'll probably jot some ideas of some topics and some pictures that I want to create and build, um, particularly on the Tuesday. Um, Tuesday, I'll get in. I'm normally up in the office by about half eight. Um, put all of my notes into a, a nice pretty presentation that is able to be shared with the goalkeepers so they've got that as a resource to have and look at through the week um we'll then do a review of the game um from the weekend 
there'll probably be some team meetings and stuff in the morning, uh, a bit of analysis work. We'll, uh, we don't have breakfast on a Tuesday. We have lunch on a Tuesday. We train, we have lunch, then into the gym. Um, and then from that, Wednesday is, again, probably do a little bit more analysis work. Um, and then we will... Um, training is all big pictures lots of big pictures and stuff um and then we will that's that's wednesday's done thursday thursday quite similar to tuesday minus the analysis session in the morning we'll probably do some um probably do some work around um some set pieces we'll start as staff looking at set pieces we will then um We'll then do the session gym in the afternoon. Uh, Fridays off, Friday I tend to leave as like a complete sort of chill out rest day. Um, and then Saturday's a quick um, a quick day in the train. Done, let the players go and rest. Um, and then Sunday's a game day. And then how, in terms of the way that you plan your week, mm -hmm. do, you, do you plan in, in blocks? Do you play damp, plan day by day, week by week, month by month? How does that work for you? I tend to work just week by week, so I'll know what topics, what pictures I want to get out. And obviously that changes based on the needs from the outfield coaches um, and from the wider squad as well. So some days I might have to miss a bit out or I get more contact time and I've got to pull some stuff from Wednesday into the Tuesday. But there'll be a basis and I'll go right in the week, I want to cover six or seven different pictures. Um, and as long as I get them out, I'm, I'm happy. And that's sort of how I base my planning. Okay, and then just in terms of all that, how much are you uh, engaging with the goalkeepers about what the actual content is and how important is that relationship that you've got with the actual individual goalkeepers? Uh, we'll, so we'll speak pre-session. I'll give them a basic run through. Oh, these are some of the pictures we're going to look at creating. But on the Tuesday, uh, Tuesday afternoon, we tend to go through, right, this is the opposition. This is what the opposition looked like. These are some pictures, some challenges, some questions that they're going to pose to us that allows them to start thinking of how they're going to start solving those problems. Um, come the Wednesday, we might touch on it again on the Wednesday morning and just quick refresh. And then we, I let them problem solve out on the pitch. I don't like to give too many answers. So um, we'll get out, we'll, we'll set up sessions, we'll set up practices and, and it, it's then a lot to them to solve the problems and with my help fix anything that they might be struggling with and, yeah, it's not so much you're on them, giving them the answers all the time. You need them to solve it because I'm 60 yards away on a match day and can't make the decisions for them. So you have to allow the goalkeepers to become decision makers. And well, the other thing, when I mean, you've got two very capable goalkeepers that you're working <laughs> with, only one can play. Yes. But how do you manage that relationship? And also, how do you then tailor, what do you do with your training sessions in terms of individual to team and individual to the goalkeeper who's playing versus individual to the goalkeeper who's not playing? How does that relationship work? As a, as a goalkeeper, you, because there is only the two of you, you kind of get an, a feeling and a know as to who's going to be playing at the weekend. Like you, could, it, you don't chop and change as much as you do with the outfield players. Um, the keeper plays, the keeper has good rhythm. So you, you carry that on. Um, and that's, that's a fairly standard across, across the professional game. You know, you're not rotating your keepers like you rotate your, your midfield players or your forward players. So you kind of know and, and it, it tends to not leave any of those really difficult conversations because everyone's along the same, everyone thinks the same way. Um, you know, you're around each other for, for near enough sort of six hours a day. Um, so you do really become the same person essentially. Right. Now, I've got a question. In terms of your coaching philosophy, mm -hmm. are you able to summarise what that is? <laughs> no, honestly, I probably couldn't. Um, I, I, couldn't I couldn't look at how I coach and go, right, this is what I do and this is how I do it. Um, for me, I've got probably, if, I, I don't know if this counts as a philosophy, but for, for me, it's just building game scenarios and game pitches to allow goalkeepers to become decision makers. In... I mean, yeah, 
No, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really good point. It's a really good conversation which is happening at the moment within that goalkeeping world is the types of sessions that people see and then how in, how they then impact a goalkeeper's performance on a Saturday. And I think it was something that Arsene Wenger said years and years ago. He was saying you actually train the decision before you train the actual um, physical outcome, physical whatever it is. For, so in a centre midfielder's perspective, it's the scan, the look, where am I passing the ball before then actually the ball comes to your feet. And it's one thing that I've noticed since having that massive period of time out of not playing in goals and going back in goals is the decision. Yeah. I can still catch a ball, I can still save a ball, but when that ball's coming through, do you know whether or not to come or not? And yeah. I mean, in your time from goalkeeping, coaching that is, do you yes. think there's been this, a shift in the way that goalkeepers are being coached? Yeah, I think there is massively. And I think social media is a big driving factor in that. I think you see in a lot of these social media sessions where it's lots of equipment, lots of cool toys, lots of gadgets, six or seven footballs in one hit, you know, big top corner saves, really prescribed outcomes so that it looks great on camera. But and they've got their purpose. They've got their time in a week. They're a good little blowout and stuff. But at the same time, why are you doing it? Why are they doing that? Why are you doing those sessions? And if you can't justify why you're doing what you're doing, don't do it. I love that answer. I think that's a very good answer. I had that same similar conversation with other people, especially around social media. Uh, I don't know. I think I put it as um, you've got educators and you've got entertainers, and there's got to yeah. be a, a, a somewhere in between. There's got to be a mixing of the two because there seem to be two very distinct camps at the moment. But one thing you mentioned there is about prescribed service. So this, in effect, is a goalkeeper taking volleys. Let's say you know exactly what's happening, you know exactly where the balls come in, and you're just going to repeat that. And there's yeah. a big conversation at the moment around the use of prescribed service within goalkeeping sessions. Yeah. What are your thoughts around that? Um, I would never, as a coach or as a player, want to get out on pitch. And the first thing that happens is I've got a ball being struck off the deck, trying to stick it in the top corner or trying to stretch me, trying to test me. I've just come out. I need to get warm. I need to get activated. I need to get moving. And there are probably better services than a volley to use like a strike off the floor just into the hands and prescribing what your outcome is going to be okay you're going to catch it's going to be in and around you but at the same time you know i think for me volleys work as a service um the keepers are like you know what's coming you know what's happening you know if you're striking a volley but it, it's nice it's in it's there, it's there it's there getting feels for the ball getting yourself built into the session and then that slowly moves into your varied and random services as you go through. I don't think you can come straight out from your set for, straight out to your session, do your warm up, do your dynamic warm up, get your body prepared without getting your mind, your eyes, and your hands prepared as well. So I think you do have to build into your session, um, and you sort of have that sort of balance off between prescribed and varied. Um, and there's a, there, I'm sure there's a table and stuff that people use with all of that sort of stuff with prescribed and varied outcomes and long lasting benefits and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, for me, it's, you, you can't come out and go straight into your varied and random. You've got to activate the mind as much as the body. I like that answer. Again, you've said some things that I know, you know, you've coached me. Yeah. Uh, before I say me, so I kind of like what you, what you do in general. Um, yeah. I've got, I've got one final question that um, I'm going to, ask you in a, in a little bit actually because I'm going to go through the questions that have been asked um, yes. so far but for anyone who's in the chat at the moment if you've got a question for Craig now is your time to type it into the chat um, right we've got some specific questions in here one of them uh, is, is a, a question from Jake Galazzi hopefully I'm saying that right uh, he said what keeper would you like to train the most but I'm going to ask you to put that question on hold because the second part of the question is would you rather train experienced or youth now you've got a good experience across all ages you've also got a good experience of uh, men and women as well so if you what's what's been the favorite or, or what's your favorite age or, uh, to coach you know what it's such a sit on the fence answer but I actually don't have a fate like, I actually don't have a favorite because they're all so different. Um, I love them all for such different reasons as well. Um, obviously, your senior football is about winning games. It's about competing for, for titles and trophies. 
and your youth football is about developing players, developing individuals and seeing them grow and, and flourish. So I think you've got two very different um, rewards for your work that, and I really do enjoy the both. Um, so I, I probably couldn't give an answer to that, to be fair. That is a very sit on the fence answer. Yeah, I, I know it, it is, but at the end of, but yeah, it's, yeah, I'd, if you said to me tomorrow, you've got to just coach kids, I'd be like, or oh. if you said, oh, you're never coaching kids again, you just coach adults, I'd be like, okay, cool. So I enjoy them both. Well, this is a, a question from DK1 Goalkeeping. Uh, if you haven't checked out his Instagram page and Twitter page, um, Dece is, is pretty decent in what he does as well. It's well worth checking that out. Uh, let everyone else know who's on the chat. His question is about you, because it, it sounds like it looks like he's in a similar position that you were in previously. He's playing. And now he's coaching. And he actually coaches Swindon women's uh, team. And he asks, uh, why or how did you come to the decision to stop focusing on your playing and start focusing on your coaching? I just weren't good enough as a player. That's probably the most honest way of putting it. I, I, I wasn't. I'm still not. I, I still try and play and I get through just about. But I wasn't good enough. I wasn't going to make a career out of it. But I knew I wanted to be involved in football. Um, so I think it was a really easy, a real easy choice for me to make. Um, is to make put my efforts into my coaching as opposed to my playing. When you were playing before, did you enjoy training more or did you enjoy playing more? I'll be honest, I didn't really train. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably why I'm at where I'm at, isn't it? You know, I could have been all right if I trained, but yeah, train hard, kids. Train hard, kids. Right. Um, uh, what's your advice? This is from T underscore Drakeley. What advice would you give to young goalkeepers? So this might be now in the scenario that actually you're the person who's casting an eye over a trial, uh, looking to bring someone into your academy. What sort of what sort of traits, what sort of tips are you looking at? Don't try and set the world alight. You know, um, for me personally, simple works. So I've been talking for 40 minutes. People probably realise I'm quite a simple person. Um, just t do the basics right. It I mean, it depends also what age you're at, um, but you know, good communicator. Show you link in well with your your other guests, your other teammates that are there. Um, you know, show that you're able to link in well with them and communicate with them. You're not going to know names straight away, but you've got your basic communications, and that's a real key thing. Is showing as the goalkeeper, you've got a link with um, with the team. That's some of the bits I look for particularly. Yeah, I find it's a bit difficult with goalkeeping when you're trialling because if you're a centre midfielder or a centre forward, you can make things happen. Yeah. Whereas yeah. when you're a goalkeeper, the game has to come to you the majority of the time in order for you to impress. Yeah, definitely. Don't try and impress either. Just, just play your own game. And... Um, Edwards underscore 28 underscore, again, has asked this actually about three or four times in the chat. Uh, he's asking, this is quite a leading question as well, potentially quite a dangerous question for you. But what's the best goalkeeper, or who is the best goalkeeper that you've ever coached? Okay, yeah, do you know what? When I was at Watford, um, Carnesis, I think that's, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, was one of the first team keepers. I think he was second choice. Came and played an under twenty threes game, um, so I did his warm up and worked with him through the game. Um, obviously, as a Premier League keeper, you know he's one of the best in the world. Um, so that was a that was a real privilege to uh, to be able to work with him. Um, be it for, for a very short space of time um, but yeah that was very that was very good uh, Peanut Buckle 741 very topical at the moment uh, mm -hmm. what, what sort of tips would you give a goalkeeper during lockdown? Uh, um, have a bit of a break from football I've been yeah. the youngsters as well that, that we've got at Reading have a break from football miss football for a little bit because then your hunger and your desire when you get back in is going to be so much greater um yeah i think yeah enjoy this time to have a break and have a little mental recharge do some learning learn sort of a bit of a coach's perspective as well because you might see the game slightly differently that will help with your communication and your tactical understanding uh, on that from becoming a, a coach yourself and a good coach, uh, you know, sort of a highly qualified coach. Has that helped your playing? I see the game a lot better now, yeah, for sure. Um, technically, I'm probably a little bit tidier now than I ever have been. Um, yeah, I mean, the problem for me has always been moving around the goal and actually diving. But I think, yeah, 
other than that, seeing the game and understanding the game has definitely improved. Two two questions that I think are quite um, quite pertinent on here. Alec, Alec McLachlan, one, um, has, has just said he signed for a new team and the goalkeeping coach has just been let go. So he's going to be either training alone or training with the other goalkeeper. What sort of tips could you give him in order to maximise his potential? Um, don't force goalkeeping sessions. I think it's probably the biggest thing. You know, get involved with the team. Um, do some do some work with the outfield players. Become maybe a little bit more of a better outfield player. Use that time as an opportunity. Obviously, fingers crossed the club do get somebody else in to, to come and work with you. Um, other than that, I mean, there, there's... Obviously, all the videos that we've done previously um, with the sessions where it's just me and you. So if you've got another keeper there, um, you can take some of the practices and adapt them and adjust them to, to suit your needs as well. Just out of, out of interest, the, I was listening to one podcast, I think it was not long ago, and they were talking about the crossover now between what was kind of goalkeepers go as their group, go over there, and now the merging of the two between outfield players and goalkeepers and goalkeepers getting involved very much in the warm-up and you know, mm -hmm. passing drills that might go on, the rondos or whatever they're doing. How does that work at Reading? How do you work it? Um, we tend to try and start sort of 10 minutes early just to try and get some more, bit more contact time in. We like to do a bit of power work out on the pitch with the med balls and resistance bands and stuff. Um, but... I've I've got plans to involve the keepers in some some team warm ups a little bit more and um, some more of the other bits and pieces with the team um, possession practices and things like that because um, I think the link between the team is important. We're asking goalkeepers to be communicators and effective communicators, but we're not providing with opportunities to build those on pitch relationships with players. Um, so, yeah, I think that's 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 going to be a big one that I'm I'm looking at, at changing at Reading next year. So if uh, if Grace is still in the chat, then she'll be excited to hear that. I'm sure. Yeah, I love it. She'll love it. Less time with me. <laughs> right, Rob McKenna has asked, what, what gloves do you use? Uh, S1. And in, in any particular type of S1s? Um, at the minute, I'm a big fan of the Sapphires because they match the training kit really well. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about look rather yeah. than performance. I'm I'm a big roll finger fan. Um, I'm a big fan of roll fingers personally. So, yeah. So the blue and white sapphires are your glove of choice? Yeah, my glove of choice at the minute, yeah. Alec McLaughlin again up the S1. Um, right, my final question for you. Thanks for that. I mean, that's been 45 minutes. That's fine, that's fine. I'll send so you... Because, I, like I mean, we chat and you do train me every now and again, normally just before I'm going on Soccer AM, just to uh, do something. Yeah. But I don't think I've ever asked you questions about your goalkeeping philosophy and the way that it works in so much detail. So it's been really interesting for me, uh, let alone anyone else on the chat. So I hope it's been useful for them. My last question to you is, yes. you can choose three goalkeepers that you're going to coach. They're from any age, any time in history. They're at their peak. <sighs> Who are you choosing and why? I'd say Neuer would be one. Um, I'd pick him because I think he's he's been revolutionary in what he's done um, and how he sort of changed the role of the goalkeeper. Um, he'd say he'd be my first one. Um, this is a tough one. So, uh, there, I? David Seaman. Okay. I just think iconic um, England keeper. I watched him growing up. Um, and oh. David David Seaman with or without the ponytail would be one question. Why are you still thinking of with, the, the with? Does the ponytail count as the second as the third person? Because I can't. Think of we'll throw you in the session. Ah, oh, cheers, mate. Thanks. I appreciate. It. I did, I quite enjoy that with Neuer, Seaman. Yeah. And me. Yeah. I reckon there's, there's a slight gap in ability there. Uh, we'll leave people think who's who's who falls into what order there. Yeah, maybe if we take David Seaman now, Neuer, maybe when he was sixteen or something, <laughs> and me now there might be some sort of meeting in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Well, thanks. I'll look forward to that session whenever you're going to arrange that. I'll uh, I'll make some calls. Okay, Good. brilliant. All right, cheers, mate, for that. I'll, I'll let you drive the rest of the way home. Hopefully, you got. Yeah, I've, I'm. I haven't actually got far from when I called you. <laughs> so, yeah. Just, just the hour to go then.
Yes, yes, just the hour to go. So fingers crossed I'll get there. Nice one. Right, right. thanks very much for that chat. No worries. Appreciate it. Take care. Cool. See you, mate.